Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 19th of November. And this quick look at the week ahead, beginning the 22nd of November, uh, with me, Michael Hewson. And it's been a divergent, I think, a diverse week, a divergent week for equity markets. We've seen underperformance from the FTSE 100 for most of this week, while at the same time also seeing record highs for the likes of the DAX, um, the CAC Current, and obviously the wider Euro stocks, you know, stocks 50, the, 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 the stock 600 as well. And it's been a little bit of a strange one because I think one of the key takeaways from this week has been reports that have been basically trickling out from um, Europe that um, infection rates there are rising quite sharply. Um, and yet for the most part of this week, we've seen German, French, and European shares maintain their resilience until today. Um, today, we've seen a little bit of a roll off um, on the basis that lockdowns are returning. We've heard the Austrian government announce this morning that they're implementing a 20 day lockdown. And even, even more troublingly, um, imposing mandatory vaccines from the 1st of February next year. And that is a really significant change. And if it's followed by other governments who seem to be really struggling to get infection rates down, I think it's going to make it a very, very difficult winter for European markets. And certainly I think what we're seeing at the moment with respect to the way markets in Europe are behaving today appears to be um, indicative of that. If we just look at the daily candle here for today in the DAX, we've seen incremental rises all of this week, markets rising um, or slowly drifting higher, uh, more on a lack of, uh, lack of interest, I think, than anything else. And then today, I think the realities hit home. Governments are struggling, high energy prices, supply chain disruptions. I think there are concerns that even with the ECB, maintaining their um, fairly loose monetary policy, um, it's going to be a very difficult winter um, for financial markets as well as for the rest of us. And the FTSE 100, which has been in pretty much full risk-off mode all week, um, is also um, heading lower, even though at one point this morning it was actually outperforming. So let's look at this week's key markets. And as we can see from this chart here, or this 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 watch list here, FTSE 100 has um, shows a completely different picture to what's was being shown on the DAX and the CAC Caron. We've seen since Friday um, a daily decline every single day this week, and we're heading back to that key support level that I've been talking about, have been mentioning for several weeks now, or several days now. The 7190 area, 718090 area coincides with the low on the 29th of October. Um, and we've also got the 50 day moving average coming in as well. Now, at the moment, here in the UK, there doesn't appear to be any sign that the UK government is leaning towards um, further restrictions. The booster campaign um, is running quite nicely, currently running around about 13 million people have had their booster jab, which probably means that the vast majority of more vulnerable cohort of the population um, are, as, are as protected as they possibly can be. What we've also seen um, this week as we look at, look at US markets is again, we've seen more record highs, the S&P 500, um, as well as um, the NASDAQ as well. I uh, certainly, certainly think going forward into um, November and December, the air is starting to get a little bit thin, given the fact that if we actually look at the year to date gains for, say, for example, the S&P 500, um, we haven't haven't done too badly. And you've really got to ask yourself, um, even allowing for the fact that the Fed is now starting to taper its asset purchase program. Um, how much juice there is left in the tank for 2021. Um, 
we've had a whole host of central banks, sorry, it's not central banks, uh, investment banks um, revise higher their projections for next year for the S&P 500. We've had Goldman's talking about 5,100 for the S&P 500, um, which you know, I think if you'd, if you'd said that to me um, last year, this time last year, I would have said was completely unrealistic. But now when we're at 4,600, you sort of, you sort of question, well, actually, maybe there's a distinct possibility we could see that. Um, so what's what's happening? You know, what's happening today? Well, obviously, travel and leisure is getting hit hard um, on the back of these um, these these lockdown headlines and um, uh, mandatory vaccination headlines. Maybe this is just a, a little bit of end of week collie wobbles and things will settle down as we head into next week, which is also Thanksgiving week in the US. And if we look at back, if we look back at some of the data that we've seen this week, by and large, it actually hasn't been that bad. We've seen some fairly decent earnings announcements. Um, we've seen um, some fairly positive economic data going forward. So when you look past all of these dark headlines and actually look at the actual numbers themselves, things are still um, better than they were, say, for example, um, this time last year. So I think sometimes it's important to, um, when you have, when you absorb these sorts of headlines, take a little bit of a step back, try and not get caught up in the noise of the headlines and actually look much more dispassionately at what's happening with respect to the actual price action itself. So obviously oil prices have taken a step back on the back of these renewed lockdown fears, which in, in some respects actually might be a blessing in disguise because it certainly does take some of the heat out of the inflation discussion. Um, earlier this week, we, thought we saw UK CPI hit, the, hit its highest level in you know, in, in over 10 years at 4.2%. I think what was particularly notable was, uh, and it didn't really get widely reported, was that retail prices, the RPI, um, moved above 6%. Now, it's not been above 6% since 1990. It's 31 years ago. So that gives you an indication of how hot inflation is running at the moment. Now, for the time being, it doesn't appear to be affecting consumer confidence um, any more badly than, say, for example, the lockdown headlines of 18 to 20 months ago. And I think that's largely because a large part of the UK population has probably still got quite a bit of disposable income as a consequence of the fact that um, they weren't able to spend as much money this year because they weren't allowed to go on overseas holidays. They stayed at home, um, probably took um, more short breaks and rather um, longer breaks. And the fact that unemployment is once again returning to the levels of that it was pre-pandemic and there are over one million vacancies. So looking past all of the bleak headlines, there are certainly pockets of optimism to be found. So certainly relief in oil prices is welcome. We've fallen below the 50-day moving average. The big thing now is for us to fall below this low here to get some sort of semblance as to whether or not we could well see further declines in Brent crude prices. I think also these reports of a coordinated SPR release, strategic petroleum reserves from uh, the US, China and Japan is also um, weighing on the price, as well as concerns about a drop in demand for oil products in the event that Europe does go down uh, or good parts of Europe go down a full lockdown route. Certainly they're talking about the prospect of a full lockdown in Germany. We're not there yet, but um, if, if that does happen, and certainly the pressure on health services there does appear to be rising, then that could well um, help to keep a lid on Brent crude prices. But obviously that is also dependent on the fact that um, we don't get a cold snap. Um, if we do get a cold snap of weather, that could muddy the picture even more than it already has done. It's been a good week for the pound this week, by and large, struggling to get above 135 at the moment, but against the euro, it's had a really solid week. The big level on cable at the moment is around 133 and a half. Seen a bit of a sell-off from the 135 
10.15 area. If you've been following my daily notes on the chart forums, you'll know that there is a bit of resistance around about 135, 135.20. And for us to, to make progress back towards the top of this channel, we really need to see a break of that 135.20 area there. More importantly, I think um, being long as sterling, um, if we look at euro sterling, that has continued to come under pressure. And the fact that Christine Lagarde earlier today suggested that the ECB is in no rush um, to raise interest rates and doesn't see the prospect of a rate rise next year, um, that is also putting pressure on the euro. And that with, with the wider question, I think, being whether or not the Bank of England will raise rates when it meets in December. Certainly, they, they, they haven't historically been minded to push rates up just before Christmas. But there's, a, there's always a first time for everything. But as with Andrew Bailey and, and the, the Motley crew at the MPC, who knows what they're going to do? Um, my hunch says they may hike rates. Certainly, the markets are cautiously pricing some form of move on rates in December. But given the shambles earlier this month, I certainly wouldn't put my mortgage on it. So, um, but at the moment, the the um, stars are aligning for a possible 0.15% interest rate rise when the Bank of England meets um, in mid-December. So that should um, broadly support the pound um, going into the end of the year, probably more so against the euro than anything else. So as we look ahead to next week, we're fairly light on the data front. If we look at the way the dollar's performing, once again, that's breaking out to the top side. I don't think that is going to change. And certainly, I think in terms of Fed policy speak, um, the likelihood is that the dollar is probably going to continue to make gains and push up towards the 1000 level on the CMC dollar index. Um, this this level here and the, these, these peaks all the way back here in September. Why do I say that? Well, we've got third quarter GDP out of the US on the 24th of November. We've also got PCE deflator, which is core, core deflator, which is the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation measure. And that is likely um, to move above uh, move above four percent um, from three point six percent and to levels last seen in nineteen ninety with with the fed minutes latest fed minutes also due out, I think it should create for an interesting dynamic when it comes to the tone of the conversations that were being had about the tapering of asset purchases. We all know that the Fed is tapering. Uh, $10 billion in treasuries and $5 billion in mortgage-backed securities starting uh, this month. The bigger question, I think, for me is whether the discussion deviated into a higher monthly taper amount and how many people or how many MPC, FOMC members were calling for a higher amount. Certainly recent comments from the likes of James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed who is a voting member next year. He's not a voting member this year, but he is a voting member next year. And he's been calling for a faster taper of asset purchases um, when we head into 2022. And it'll be interesting to see whether or not there are any other um, members. Um, Raphael Bostic has also been a policy, a Fed policymaker who's been calling for rate rises next year. So the Fed is definitely tilting in a much more hawkish direction as we head into next year. And that's likely to, to I think, keep with upward pressure on the dollar. And that's essentially why I think cable is going to be very, very difficult to call. Because I think in terms of sterling, sterling is going to be very much um, a play probably against the lower yielding currencies like the euro, the Swiss franc, and the Japanese yen than it is against the dollar. Having said that, I would be surprised if it drops much below 132 um, as we head into 2022. So we've got the Fed minutes on the 24th, we've got US PCE deflator on the 24th, and we've got US third quarter GDP also on the 24th. And we're expecting a modest upward revision to that headline number, 22.2%. We've also got flash PMIs. Um, they're likely to be modestly weaker for November from the UK, Germany, and France. Um, and we've also got the German IFO business climate survey. Given the recent commentary about 
lockdowns, supply chain disruptions and what have you, I would be very surprised if we don't see further weakness in all of those flash PMIs uh, and more particular, I think the German IFO business survey for November as well. Um, higher hospitalization rates, localized restrictions, rising factory gate prices, German PPI um, it for, for um, the latest German PPI numbers, 18.2% year on year. That is a record high. Now think about that, 18.2%. I mean, that is really a difficult number to absorb if you're a German business, particularly a German business who's operating in the Mittelstadt. Um, you know, how do you pass those increases on um, in terms of do you absorb them? In which case, German equities could be starting to look a little bit frothy, or do you pass them on to the customer? Um, in terms of companies that are reporting next week, um, pretty thin on the ground earning season is sort of winding down. Um, there's been there's a number out there that might be worth keeping an eye on. Zoom video communications, given the lockdown headlines and the fact that Zoom is very much underperformed so far this year, um, come well off its highs from last year, maybe that's due a bit of a rebound um, if new lockdowns are coming. Um, certainly was a big winner in 2020, less so um, this year. So the big question I think is how, how are revenues doing? Well, they're, they're continuing to improve. Um, company expects to see full year revenues of around about $4 billion, which is a significant improvement on expectations at the start of the year, and yet the shares are still lower. And I think it really comes down to um, revenues relative to overall valuation. And the valuation is still pretty high, even with the fact that revenues are an awful lot higher. So um, this valuation is $75 billion. Um, just in case you were wondering. So $4 billion turnover, it's not too shabby um, and probably more in keeping, more realistic than it was, say, for example, um, 12 months ago. So I'll be keeping an eye out for that. That's due on the 22nd. Um, we've also got Best Buy. Well, from the numbers that we've seen from Walmart, Target um, and Home Depot over the course of the past week, those numbers have been fairly positive. Um, and certainly if we look at um, Best Buy's share price over the course of the past decade or so. It's been pretty decent, but as with Target, as with Walmart, there are concerns about rising costs and supply chain disruptions. And if we look at Best Buy's share price, we have seen a bit of a bearish reversal here. We haven't quite taken out these peaks through here. And rising costs as a result, taking on extra staff and what have you, the rise has been pretty parabolic um, since the beginning of October. Maybe it's time for a little bit of a pullback, given the fact that it's so far away from its 200 day moving average. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so those, 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 those Q3 numbers are out on the 23rd. Certainly they've been doing very well online. Q1 revenues are very, very positive, $11.64 billion. Q2 was 11.85 billion dollars and the company expects to um, return 11.5 billion dollars in Q3. So keep an eye out for Best Buy. Also got Johnson Matthew who issued a profits warning earlier this month um, and we can see that in, that in the share price movement on that particular um, on that particular chart there. Let me just make the font bigger so we can actually actually see it here. Let me just get rid of the floating floating value box. Don't want that. Now you may have noticed there, ladies and gentlemen, that um, we now have a volume for shares. So if you want to display volume for shares um, underneath the chart, you can do that from the settings menu right here. Just select the volume option. It's right there. And as you can see, that drop down there um, saw a significant um, sell off back towards the lows of earlier uh, of, of a year ago around about the 30th of November. So Johnson Matthews share price, half first half numbers said they were going to be exiting the battery materials business. Net assets of the business are around about $340 million. 
and it seems a shame that they're exiting the batteries business just at the time that electric vehicles are starting to take off but there you go apparently the margins are too thin so they're looking to offload it so that's uh that's um that's johnson methy for you and um that's pretty much it for this week's weekly market update once again thank you very much for listening hope you all have a great weekend and i will speak to you all same time same place next week thank you very much for listening